Ball Chesterfield draw on Saturday. More to be revealed very shortly in the programme. Did you know about that one, Stel? You missed what, that. But he's one. returning to Menel. I saw him yeah. saw him Saturday, but uh, yeah, no, more to come. That, so more to come. Is that clickbait? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming <laughs> that's a bit of clickbait of a headline. Well, there's hey, there's certainly a lot of badger baiting or magpie baiting been going on over the weekend, aren't there, between players and uh, fans and God knows what else. But we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, as my dad used to say, uh, anyone from a Nottingham uh, background, probably the same in the East Midlands, stop your mithering, son. Mithering. Is that a word you come across, used to use in Derby? Old school word? Yeah, yeah mithering. mithering. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Um, Notts County's Twitterati have reached DEFCON 5 on the nuclear scale over the weekend. Jim O'Brien, Connell Rawlinson and Ruben Rodriguez are all now involved. Online spats abound. Notts fans digging each other out. Are we overreacting? How concerned are you? It's one win and three draws, I think, unbeaten in four under Luke Williams. Here's one for you. Ian Birchinell started with two wins in nine and four defeats in his first six league games. Thoughts, please? Um, the voice of reason, that is Mark Stallard, will seek to make sense of it all in blissful social media isolation in Yorkshire, and that's absolutely the best place to be. Um, we will come back to that uh, shortly. Um, Stell, um, four games in, um, one or two people are disgruntled, um, we've had players uh, getting entrapped a little bit with social media. Um, what's your take? And we know it's got to be 10 before we start making judgments. What's your take four games in? Um, not too much. I, I think it's been a, a solid, if unspectacular, start to the season. Um, yeah, I'm certainly not in the uh, in the group that think it's a disaster, that think, you know... Woe is me, but I know that's that's the world nowadays. Everything's got to be doom or gloom or absolutely amazing, and there's not a lot of room for anything in between. Um, I think, yeah, I, th I think being unbeaten is is decent. I think six points out of twelve is not what we would have hoped for, but uh, you know, it's it's very very early days in a season. Very early days in a season. A new manager. Some new players needing to, you know, to get involved with a new way of playing. Um, and also, you've got to compete against opposition teams that do their best to try and stop you doing what you want to do. So, uh, while it's not been perfect and it's not really pulled up any any particular trees, there's been positive, encouraging signs um, and bits that, that need to be improved on. Um, good evening to Andrew Blatherwick and to Duncan Comrie. Lee Brearley first on the message boards. Slow start Saturday, but the young lad Langstaff looks a right handful and Scott looked promising when he came on. My worry is in the middle of that defence. All in all, we look better than last season. And uh, evening to Luke Walsh from the VNL pos uh, podcast, flying the Halifax flag. Crikey, if you think we've got problems, take a look where Halifax are at the minute. Lost the manager and most of the players. Uh, Luke is watching from Mallorca up the Shaman. Uh, Chris B, main worries for me so far is we still seem to have same frailties as last season, conceding poor goals and a lack of momentum in our build-up play. Um Get sending those thoughts in and good evening to Paul Huskisson as well. Um, Kedwin Scott, we had this kind of debate last week about one up top, two up top, accommodating Ruben. And um, I think you kind of had a feeling that maybe Luke would stick with one. Um, some of his comments from his presser on Thursday kind of left the door open and I think a lot of people said when Kedwin came on uh, those two and Austin as well it was a um, a different proposition now do you think that was because of the introduction of Scott and Austin or do you think it was as much because uh, I listened to your comments in the car on the way home that not employed a more urgent and a slightly more direct approach well, I, I think it's a bit of both. You've got to give credit to the two lads that came on because they certainly made a difference. You know, Sam Austin and Kedwin Scott, when they came on, not livened up. Now, that might have coincided with, as I say, boringly many a time, playing at 2-0 down is sometimes the easiest time to play because 
it makes your mind up. It galvanises you in how you've got to go about it. Uh, you're still in the game. You know if you get the next goal, you're in the game, as Saturday proved. Um, but, you know, you have got to have a bit more urgency in your play. And I think, I think that's a good word, urgency. I think that is what was lacking in the first half. I think, you know, I, I know everybody wants to say it was a doom and gloom for first 10, 15 minutes. Up until the goal, they, they started all right. They started OK. They started, started passing the ball around well. But they were maybe missing that urgency. They had a couple of good balls into good areas in the box. Didn't, nothing came from it. And then the goal went in. And then, yeah, we, we came a little bit pedestrian in our play. You know, against a good Chesterfield team. Let, let's make no bones about it. Um, but the change, the difference. You know, first 10 minutes of the second half, I thought we were all over the place as well. And then we went two down. Could have gone three down. Um, and I think that would have been possibly game over. But, you know... Luke Williams makes the substitutions. And when you make substitutions, it's sometimes you tweak formation, sometimes you, you tinker with things, sometimes you throw an extra attacker on or whatever, and you hope it works. But some the main thing you want is impact. You want impact from your substitutes because you don't make substitutions, you know, to keep things going the same way when you're 2-0 down. You want impact, and that's exactly what they provided. They provided impetus for the team. And that, that word, urgency, they had an urgency about them that, OK, we still got to go about it. The framework is to pass the ball out from the back, play through the thirds. But when you're 2-0 down, it just galvanises that urgency that we can't take 20 minutes to get this next goal. We could do with it in the next five. And and it's that urgency that I, that I wish, and it's very easy to say, very easy for us to sit here and talk about. I wish they'd start games and play a lot of the games at 0-0, 1-0, 1-0, whatever the scoreline is, with that urgency. Because there's no doubt about it, when they did that, they've got good quality players, they've got an out-and-out goal scorer who can find the back of the net, and that means you're never out of a game. Mm. So I think, you know, the final 30 minutes, they could have gone on and won the game. You know, and that, that you, you look at what's changed between the, you know, the, the, 30 minutes at the end of the first half and, and the, the 30 minutes at the end of the second half, for me, it was that urgency and that desire to go forward and go forward with pace, you know, really getting about the opposition and belief as well. All, all key words that, that made the difference. But, you know, again, you, you've got to give them credit. They showed the character. They showed the quality. Got back in the game. They could have nicked it. They could have lost it. Of course they could. So, again, not perfect. You know, plenty to work on. But promising signs that that when he, when they can get it all together, then then we will be a handful. And 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 again, Chesterfield will be one of the the top teams in this division, given you know players being fit and what have you. They they're a tough team, a tough team to play against, and they'll beat more teams than they, they lose to at this level. Uh, kind of echoing then sentiments, Stelt, John Parr says, thought Knotts played better when Austin and Scott came on and started playing with more intensity going forward. And please, send in your thoughts from um, Saturday. Difficult game to judge in respect of, and I'll, and I'll be totally candid, candid here, um, you try and be as objective and as honest as you can. Um, I thought we were very poor for 60 minutes, if I'm honest with you. I also thought at Gateshead, that's probably one of the worst away performances I've seen. However, as you know, I am all about results. What you have to give credit to the players, the coaching staff for, is they eked out results and didn't get beaten in either of those two games. And I guess one of the things from Saturday um, was um, the booing of the players at half time? And Lippy Jane says, "I don't like boos. I also think people should think before they write something on Twitter." Uh, although, thankfully, I do not follow anyone who is offensive. We don't even know um, whether they are actually Knox fans. Lippy Jane, right on cue after what I've said. Last thirty minutes were fantastic. Um, Crispy, I'm not one to boo, but I think there's a big difference between booing the team and booing specific players or going after them on social media. Um, Stel, we're all amateurs, OK? Every one of us on this message board, me, you're a professional. Um, if you think back to when you were playing, um, I don't know whether you were ever 
inverted commas subject of the boo boys or whether you were always banging them in. Um, but I'm guessing someone in the dressing room at any given time of a team squad that you were playing kind of got more criticism or was kind of the go-to person to get some criticism. This is obviously before social media, irrespective sometimes of how they perform. Yeah, you, you you occasionally got you know the scapegoat if you want you want to put it that way. But if if I'm absolutely honest, and obviously when I played ball, there was no social media, so we didn't have yeah. that side of it. Yeah, booing and and fan reaction in ground is is well, it's water off a duck's back to a professional. It certainly was in my my time and my career. Nobody, you know, you might have a bit of a somebody might have a chunter or a moan or you know. It, like Saturday, for instance, you know, you come off the fans of, of, of booed. You know, not everybody, but there's a no. there's a general disgruntlement. You're losing, and that's more frustration at losing yeah. to to a local rival in a big game, not having played particularly. I don't think they played as bad as I think I, I've seen one or two people say. But uh, first ten or fifteen minutes, I thought they started okay. They just didn't carry a threat, and it was too ponderous the build up. Like we talked about that word urgency. They didn't play with any urgency in them, so it seemed. And, and Chesterfield, you know, became the better team after they got the lead. Um, but I, as a player, I, and again, I've not been in a dressing room for over a decade, you know, in terms of how players react. And I know things are slightly different, but I don't think a player really, really responds to, or should really respond to, fans pay their money. They can, they can react in whatever way they see fit now obviously that's not me advocating people boo no. at the first opportunity and and on mass but i don't think players really really bother too much about it unless it's something personal somebody's you know you, you know picking on one player or whatever or you know something like that. but you know i think you've got to take that's part and parcel of being a footballer being a professional footballer it's the way it always has been it's the way it always probably will be um so you've got to you've got to deal with that. That's part of being a, a professional footballer, playing in front of crowds. You know, it's never never going to always be. You're never always going to be the hero. You're never always going to have it your way. So you have to put up with with the rough and the smooth. Um, the old saying: Don't get too high when it's going well. Don't get too low when it's not going so well. So you've got to take it on the chin. You have to take it on the chin and. Look, I, I think I think the dressing room is strong enough and solid enough. I think I think it's a really good not dressing room. That the, they'll take it and go. Well, we've probably not given them anything to shout about. Say it on the radio. Fans respond to what they're seeing. You know, rightly or wrongly, fans respond to what they're seeing. And there was no real urgency that that felt like they were going to, you know, get Notts fans out of the seat. And, and it, it felt like the game was drifting away a little bit. Mm. Um, like I say, I don't think knots were were as bad, maybe as as the perception was. But but again, it's a local derby; emotions are high. Um, but I, I, fan reaction shouldn't. If you are affected by fan reaction, and when there's what was there eight thousand there on on Saturday, then yeah. then it doesn't bode well for your future in the game, does it? Because if you ever play in front of really big crowds, then then you, you're going to crumble. So no, I, I don't think any of the players be bothered about that. The online stuff, the personal stuff, uh, like I said, I don't don't get involved with. I don't do it. Don't not really interested in it. Um, and and my one bit of advice would be, unfortunately, rightly or wrongly, if you're bothered by it, don't do it. Get off it. Uh, but that doesn't make it right that people should get abused. But it happens. You know it's going to happen. So you know, leave it well alone. Uh, very good. Uh, Husky says, everyone is acting like we lost at the weekend. Don't get me wrong. It was a poor first half, but we clearly showed a backbone to come back. We are one of four teams to be unbeaten in the league so far. Duncan Conway says, over the last three seasons, we've played far too many games as if we're already winning 3-0. And uh, good evening to AD Clark. Great to see you, i.e. me, before the game, Paul. Just so glad Notts turned it around. Would have never heard the end of it. Uh, AD lives in Chester 
Chesterfield, of all places. So <laughs> absolutely, he was delighted, I am sure, to see those um, two goals uh, flying from Macaulay Langstaff. Um, Derek Flowers, hopefully Luke can see the difference Austin makes to the team. Uh, but watch him start with the same lineup on Saturday. Um, we shall see. Um, question for Stell from Andrew Blatherwick. Um, speaking as a former striker, do you think Macaulay Langstaff would score goals at an even higher level, i.e. Football League? Um, he's clearly started OK in a transition from National League North, mainly part-time, uh, to uh, a, 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 a predominantly full-time league in the National League. Um, what do you think of what you've seen so far? Yeah, impressed. You know, can't help but be impressed. Kenny, four goals in the first four games, you know, two doubles at home. Um, do I think he's scored at a higher level? Yeah, I think there's every opportunity. He looks like a natural goal scorer. Score goals or take chances with his right foot and his left foot. Obviously got the header as well. Um, he's, he's one of them strikers that I think we've not had. I... I can't think of too many that we've had since probably Husey. Um, that if you put the ball in the box, there's a chance that he'll tuck it away if you're creating a chance. Not to say he's going to do a great deal of work outside the boxes, but you know, he's a goal scorer and he earns his corn by being in the right place at the right time. He's done that four times. He's missed, you know, he'll probably say himself he, he could have had a couple more. He's missed chances up at. at Gates said, and at Boreham Wood, you know, that he, that he maybe could have taken. Um, but again, a perfect example, sadly almost, of, of what I talk about in, in a striker, a goal scorer, is that he doesn't get involved too much in the game. Didn't see him for 60 minutes almost. You know, he had, I think he had one shot on the swivel. And that's, that's a good example of a goal scorer. He had one, no, no real service, you know, didn't get involved in the game too much. I think it was a ball into him after 20 minutes or whatever, and he just controlled it with his right foot, back to goal, edge of the box, spun it, it with his left foot, didn't get hold of it, trickled in the ground and, and it, at the keeper. But he was looking, receiving it back to goal on the edge of the box, but looking to get a shot away. And that is difficult to defend against because defenders think, right, I've got to be right tight to him. And then you've got the chance to spin in behind defenders and he's got the, the pace to do that, to trouble defenders in behind. So... From that aspect, the technical aspects of what I've seen of him, and again, four games do not tell you whether a player is going to play in the Premier League or drop down the leagues, you know, whatever. But what I've seen so far, very promising because he looks like he gives knots of strength and a, 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 an additional string to the bow that we've maybe not had for a while. Again, you can talk about the negatives. He doesn't do the hold-up play that, that Kyle Wooten used to last year, so you've got to marry off the, the pros and the cons. But, yeah, very positive first four games and, and hope he builds on it, hope he improves on it. And I hope that he, he will get better when the team learns about him and he learns about his teammates as well. Um, Dylan Room says, my dad said after Langstaff second that he reminds him of our Stell. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, He's faster than me. Four. Does, does Stell want to go halves on my bet on our boy Langstaff to be top scorer this season? And I think that's top scorer in the whole of the National League, not just at Knotts. Uh, Jack Hobbs, be frightening if we can get Scott and Langstaff up top together when Scott's fully fit. Stuart Edwards, we play best when we are gung-ho. Why don't we give the other team a two-goal head start in the first two minutes? Then we have 88 minutes left to pull it back and get the winner instead of 10. Uh, A.D. Clark, no pressure here. Uh, Langstaff is similar to Jamie Vardy. Speed and was non-stop on their defenders. Must be nightmare to play against exciting times. Lippy Jane, I think. So, uh, as in this is playing Scott and Langstaff together. They knew where each other was straight away. Lovely to watch. No waiting. Um, ben Hawksworth, Wooten was a good player for Knotts, but from what I've seen, I'm taking Langstaff over Wooten every day of the week. Uh, Derek Flowers adds, Macca will come into his own when he's partnered regularly with his strike partner, Scott. They know how each other plays and positions each other takes up. OK, well, let's get, let's get the striker's view on this, because I think you were certainly far from 100% convinced that the two would play together. Um, have you revised that opinion 
uh, or not? Well, yeah. Well, he obviously played two up on on Saturday with uh, Cairo Mitchell. Now, yeah. Kedwin Scott's a, a difficult one, isn't it? Because he's had this illness. He had a bit of COVID, I think, during pre-season, so he's had a disrupted pre-season. But obviously, he knows Macaulay Langstaff and vice versa. You know, they know each other's game. And and if you're going to play two two players up front, then if they've already got that understanding, that's certainly a benefit and an advantage. Um. That said, Cairo Mitchell came on at Boreham Wood, scored his goal, and and obviously Luke Williams sees him as deserving his opportunity. Um, I, I just thought the two of them, a didn't get great service on on Saturday, certainly in the first half. Um, I think there's a work to be done on the hold up play. That's both of them, you know. If I'm if I'm being critical, because that's important for a team as well. Um, but maybe that's where Kedwin Scott comes into it because you see I saw for the second goal playing back to goal showed up received the ball turned played it down the channel for, for Sam Austin who put a, put in a, a lovely cross and, and Macaulay Langstaff finished it off you know absolutely glorious move and and, and a glorious goal to, to see now maybe that's the the the, the complementary partnership that Kedwin Scott will maybe do a bit more of that hold up play that link up play showing short, coming to feet, whereas Langstaff can go in behind, run the channels. Uh, maybe that's where they bounce off each other a little bit. Well, but again, what we've seen of, of Kedwin Scott, half an hour, 45 minutes maybe, but it, promising signs and obviously his record last year. Um, but let, let's give the lad time to come in, find his feet, get up to speed. But promising signs, yeah, definitely. Because it, it's It's been quite of an ongoing debate, hasn't it, with, with Kyle Wharton having played that lone furrow up front, holding the ball up and being the club's top scorer. Um, uh, I think quite a few fans, and Gary Wardlow has just said this, um, play two up front, Ruben in the hole and five at the back. Uh, question mark. Think not. Um, there has, for whatever reason, prior to Luke, been a reticence by both Neil didn't play Ruben a great deal, and um, certainly by Ian Birchinall, to kind of accommodate Ruben and play two up front. In your expert opinion, is that because they think it's hard to get the best out of Ruben in that formation, or just individual personal preference? Well, there's a number of reasons. You know, let's not forget there was a Cal Roberts here last season as well. Yeah. You know, and and he didn't play as an out and out striker, obviously. Um, so you want a Ruben in the team. This is last season. You wanted a Ruben in the team. You wanted a Cal in the team. We wanted yeah. Carl Wooten in the team. So you have to, you know, compl- you have to do what's best for the team shape, given all the rest of the personnel in the team as well. Now this season, unfortunately, we haven't got a Cal Roberts. And that is a, that is a big hole for somebody to fill. It might be a Sam Austin. It, you know, I don't think it's going to be a Kedwin Scott. I think he, he's a centre forward. Yeah. Um, but it, it's a big hole to fill. Um, so then you sort of look at well, have we got the personnel to do a straight swap with where it was you know, front three sort of Ruben, Cal, and Kyle last season? Do you just put somebody in, you know, McCauley in for um, Kyle Wooten, and then somebody in for Cal Roberts? Or do you think, no, well, we haven't got that personnel. So we do go and just slightly rotate that that three and make it, as, as you said, a front two with Ruben allowed for, to float in behind. Um, and that, where the personnel we've got this season lends itself more to that formation, playing two up front with Ruben in behind, than maybe the personnel we had last season, whereby we didn't really have a natural partner to Kyle, uh, Kyle Wooten. Yet Ruben and Cal both like to play in them little pockets and little areas in behind, not right up top, but being able to drift. So you have to pick your formation and pick your, your way of playing based on the personnel that you have. And and I feel a little bit for Luke Williams that, you know, Cal Roberts was there for a, a fair bit of pre-season and then he's not. So yeah. then maybe you, you're your sort of thinking changes a little bit, whereas it certainly... It doesn't scupper your plans, but it certainly takes a little bit of flexibility where you might think, well, we've got Cal, we've got Ruben, we've got Sam Austin, we've got Kedwin Scott, we've got Macaulay Langstaff. 
and we could go with two up top. We could go with that front three with two withdrawn. You know, you could go about it any number of ways. You take Cal out, who let's face one of the better players, the mm. best players in the division. Then all of a sudden, you're slightly your options are slightly less, especially when it comes to it. So again, again, Sam Austin, Kedwin Scott, even Macaulay Langstaff, early days, they've still got to prove themselves fully over time at this level. Um, but there's been promising signs, plenty of promising signs, but they've got to be given time to bed in and and find, you know, find the way that naturally suits. And and obviously that allies with being fully fit as well, getting up to, to match speed. So um, promising signs, but I think we're going to be more likely to play a front two this season because I believe Kedwin Scott's more of a centre forward uh, than a number 10, if you like, nowadays that likes to play in behind. Yeah, I mean, I certainly think, if nothing else, Stel, it would have been, um, let's let's say, a brave decision to sign both of them where they were a combination, albeit Macaulay, as he's told us on a podcast, played in a slightly different role at Gateshead. It, it, it would be unusual not to be playing those two regularly. Now, Cairo has certainly scored a great, great goal, Put, put a couple of good shifts in. So it gives him options in that respect. I'd, and, and I knew as soon as I mentioned it, the reason I mentioned it to you for, for the answer, obviously everyone's been on the keyboards because everyone believes we have the way to accommodate all these players. Um, uh, Gary, uh, d -d 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 so uh, Dylan Room, we saw how you're meant to play Scott and Langstaff with that second goal. Scott come and asked for it to his feet put it out wide, and there was Langstaff. Chris B says, I think to consistently play two up top, we need to go to a flat back four. Um, as we don't have outstanding wing backs, it makes the most sense. Dylan Room, I'd have a back four and have Austin and Ruben uh, out wide. Chris uh, or Austin uh, behind the strikers and the man he put wide, says Dylan. Gary Morphis, a fully fit Scott and the first goal can only be around the corner. James Ford, of course, Scott and Langstaff are going to be playing together. Scott's been injured, so would rather wait till he's fully fit and not rush him. Too many occasions previously we've rushed a player back. Chris B says, I think Ruben would be wasted out wide. I'd probably go for a diamond with Bajrami at base, Ruben at top and with Palmer and Austin in the middle. Uh, Mark Hamilton, I'd like us to go 4-3-3. Dylan Room, 4-3-3 with Langstaff on the left. Um, a lot of Gateshead fans said he can play there. Ben Hawksworth, Ruben could play behind Langstaff and Scott, uh, but he has played his most effective and best football just behind a striker. Um, he doesn't look the same player when he's deeper, in my opinion. A.D. Clark, I tell you they're coming in thick and fast. Austin needs some credit. What a great cross for Langstaff, indeed it was. Uh, he also puts himself about, how do you think Nemane did? He seemed to pass back too often rather than take his man on. Um... Stuart Edwards, I think Luke does want to play two up top. Chris Gosling, I don't think we have the wing backs to play that system effectively. I play Brindley and Chickson as full back in a back four. Bajrami, uh, Matty anchor in the middle, Austin and Rubes behind the front two. Well, if you weren't confused before how to do it, <laughs> there you go. Uh, uh, if, if Luke's watching this, crikey, there you go. Uh, a few thoughts for you. One thing I want to pick up on, Stel. Uh, and um, I guess more of your expert views um, defensively rather than striking wise. Um, there, is, there is equally quite an age old debate about a five at the back or a four. And I think certainly when Ian was here, he much preferred a five for most of the two thirds of his tenure. Um, but he did change more to a flat back four as a one-off and then more of a regular uh, as it moved on. Um, some people would say, is Richard Brindley better as a right wing back stroke out and out right back than one of three centre halves? Likewise, is Chickson far more comfortable, let us say, as a, as a left back or left wing back where he played Saturday than sometimes when he's been accommodated in a three? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's it's part of the conundrum, isn't it? That that is part of the conundrum that all the fans will do. We'll be speaking about up and down the, you know, we're travelling up and down the country, and Luke Williams and uh, his coaching staff will be looking at and, and assessing the options that he's got. 
there's no right answer to it but you know but again it's about how you fit the jigsaw pieces in together for the best ultimate of the team you know you can't just go well i want to play a back four because then it's about what what do you play in front of it and what are the personnel for a back four over a back five you have to fit the cogs together as best you possibly can um i mean a flat back four over over a back three back five whichever way you want to call it the back five is generally done for a reason it's generally done because you don't necessarily trust your center halves to, to defend well enough in a flat back four you know now there are other reasons of course you, you know you might, you might not have wingers you might not have wide midfield players to play in front of you if you play a back four you might not have the two wide men to, to give that attacking option you might want your fullbacks to bomb forward then you might need to play two holding midfield players so it's not it's never just a well we pick the defense and then worry about what happens in front of it because it, it all goes hand in glove it all fits together so you see some teams play a back four again with with two holding midfield players you know a back three with a couple of holding midfield players gareth southgate's done it for england hasn't he on on occasion and got absolute pelters yeah. for it um but there's all different reasons to utilize and it's all done whatever you agree disagree with it's all done with the idea to utilize the team's strengths and emphasize where your strong points are and bolster where your weaknesses might be not that any manager is ever going to come out and, and say they're weak but you bolster where you think you are vulnerable and you try and get your strength in areas where you've got your better players and try and create space for them better players they're match winners so i don't know what the original question was whether it, it should we play a four or a five but yes but, i think that was the question but, yeah but every every there's no there's no right or wrong answer to it. it it really does depend on personnel richard brinley you know if you look at individuals richard brinley is could be equally adept as a right back a right wing back or a right sided center half which he's played for the majority of the last 18 months or so um Adam Chickson could play equally the same on the left-hand side. You know, I, I think he's done a really good job going forward as a left wing-back. Is that his actual natural forte? No, but I think that's more credit to him that he's done it so well, um, that he's adapted to the position and mm -hmm. given everything he possibly could, whereas he's probably more suited to being left-back, left side and centre-half of a three. Um, but again, you're talking about personnel, you know, Kyle Cameron, can he play in a, in a, in a flat back fo back four? And, and you know we know how good he is coming out with the ball, how adept he is on the ball. And if you want defenders stepping out from the back with the ball, then you do you either need a midfielder to sit back and, and fill the space, or you need two other centre halves that are there that you can say right, go step in, make that extra man. So it's it's never black and white. It's never it's never straightforward. Very good, and it's good to hear. Uh... You know, what we always try and do on this show is have a professional's viewpoint, um, as I say, uh, as as uh, I think uh, Derek Flowers, among others, says lots of managers on tonight. But we're having a respectful, good natured discussion because I, I know a lot and particularly our younger followers now have a much greater subject knowledge of tactics and players across all the European leagues than certainly I ever did. Uh, me and Stell, well, more me, Stell a little bit, you know, our football knowledge was the Panini stickers. OK, that was that was the only if, if there weren't a Panini sticker of you in the book you were collecting, I didn't know you existed. You know, um, but was there a panini sticker of you, Stell, in your day or not? Well, I think I think I've had one or two in my day, yeah, in my time. I don't know if panini stickers or some other ones, but yeah, yeah. I've had one or two. Um, OK, let's, let's read a few of your thoughts out. There's quite a few of them. Uh, Chris Gosling, I don't think we have the wing backs to play that system effectively. I play Brindley and Chickson as full back in a back four. Bajrami, Man uh, Matty anchor in the middle, Austin and Rubes behind a front two. Chris Hawksworth, uh, I said last week, um, the best two fullbacks in the league are Brindley and Chico. Um, to do, Dylan Room can't beat an armchair manager, Derek. Uh, Chris B, 
Um, do, 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 I've gone and lost it now. Apologies. Uh, uh, until Austin came on, the Mane was constantly left isolated, so did often go back. The second goal showed what happened when he had support. Uh, Chris, don't think there's anything uh, wrong with the fans having an opinion on the best eleven. Doesn't make any of us right. Absolutely. I mean, as Stokes just said, there is no right. There is no wrong. Um, uh, Dylan Room shows there is real competition for places in the cream, Chris, which is good to see. Uh, Michael. Fletcher. I think we need Langstaff and Scott playing together like they did at Gateshead. Uh, agreed, Dylan, says Chris Gosling. But I think the signings that we've seen make us stronger than last season and we need to play them. Um, Michael Wall echoing um, uh, it was the um, the royal character, the football manager, wasn't it? Uh, this, we are playing 4-4 four, four, B, 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 two. Uh, Dylan Room, I can't remember what he was called now. It was, it was Mike Bassett. Mike, Mike Bassett. Bassett. Mike, we're all Mike Bassett's Thank and you. I told them. Um, Dylan Room, uh, I think we've used five so our centre backs can come forward with the ball. We saw Cameron and Bolgreen go on a mazy run on Saturday and Cameron nearly scored. So having five provides cover for that. Uh, North Ants by that for me is the reason of the 3-5-2 and have defenders stepping out with the ball. Um, A.D. Clark would just like to see Nemanja more positive, take the man on with his pace, draw a foul at least. Uh, Terry Taylor, I'll come to this in a minute. Is it true Ben Young from Leicester is coming in as a new goalkeeper? Well, as another goalkeeper, uh, this was um, mentioned in one of our Sunday papers. Uh, Jack Hobbs, what's the opinion of Joel Taylor? What did he do wrong? Uh, Lippy Jane, who do people think we should uh, should be taking corners? I cannot bear them at the moment. Um, such wasted opportunities. Um, so, lots of um, thoughts, uh, views, all very good. Um, I want to come on to something now when I can just call it up. We'll just change the debate a, a slightly, I think, here. Um, OK, um, Stella's kind of picked up on this earlier. Um, as a footballer, when you play on the pitch, you kind of expect um, criticism from the terraces. Um, it's part and parcel of the game. You pay your money and you don't sit there like you're at a graveyard. You say what you think. Uh, and. There are people around me in the pavis who are incredibly mild-mannered people. You talk to them on the phone, butter wouldn't mouth. And then for 90 minutes, out it comes. And I think Martin Allen uh, got this spot on in one of his podcasts where he talked about football. He grew up in a footballing family. Football was like a cathedral. You know, you went down there, you'd done your work all week, and this was you letting off steam emotionally clearly you're showing your support for the club and it's kind of been the trade-off fans at grounds yeah making opinions known players expecting that trying to respond to that sometimes trying to prove people wrong you know clearly fans must make some form of difference otherwise why else would uh, you have mostly possession at home and your home record is invariably always better than your away record so there has to be some value of fans getting behind you supporting you on your home ground with the growth of social media we we now have whereas you play the 90 minutes you get showered you get on the bus and then you do whatever you do Stell, to get over the game okay social media is now omnipotent omnipresent and so as a player, you can be at home with your family at half ten, fed up, you've lost. Uh, I was going to say kick the cat, but clearly post Kurt Zuma, you cannot say that anymore. Um, but you, you, you get stressed and you get wound up. And then when you're looking on social media and you see people you don't know being abusive towards you, having a dig at you. No one likes being criticised. And I think it's one thing to say something in a ground in the heat of the moment that lasts for that. You get your showered, off you go. I think it's another with social media now intrudes into people's personal lives. And, and for me, we spoke about this before, Stell. I think it can affect people's mental health quite badly um, because you never switch off. 
you never switch off. Um, and there was some some quite direct criticism of Jim O'Brien. I won't go into the details. Um, and one or two of the other players, well, Jim had a little bite, and then one or two of the other players have got involved. And Connell Rawlinson posted this uh, at 20 to 12. Uh, I think it was Saturday night. Uh, it might have been Sunday night. Um, I've sat here all weekend and seen this beep too much. From a minority of Knots fans, not the proper fan base that comes out every week through thick and thin to support the lads. The likes of Jim, Jim O'Brien and others that have been at this club for the past few years and new lads dedicate their lives to trying to help this great club get back to where it belongs uh, and are a credit to the club. Do you think for one minute lads lose, win or draw and forget about it the moment they leave the ground? No, they don't. I've paraphrased that bit still. Um, being a footballer for a football club isn't a job, it's a privilege. Negativity in the right amount is a driving force to do better. But remember, we are only human. I understand we work in an environment that allows opinions, but eating a dead animal only makes you a jackal. Which is a pretty good analogy. Um, the lads on that pitch and in the firing line are lions. There's a way of saying your opinion without being personal. Remember that. The definition of a supporter is a person who encourages another to do well. So support, don't discourage. I think it's very well written. We had Connell on last year. I think he speaks very well. Um, thoughts, Stel? Well, the, the, the message is absolutely right. I mean, you, you want your own fans to get behind the team to support you. you. You will take criticism. You will take booing on occasion. You will take, you know, the reaction that you get in crowds, as we've spoken about before. And again, I, I'm probably not the person to speak about this because I, I see social media, it's quite easy. It's like a TV channel. If you don't like it, switch it off, you know. Um, but I gather that, that it's the, the world these days, but for younger lads and footballers are mm. younger lads. So should they be taking abuse? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. You know, personal abuse and, and off anybody, let alone, you know, supposedly your own fans. Um, but it's the unfortunately it's the world we live in isn't it there, there are idiots numpties all over the place you see it all the time unfortunately um and social media is just the, the best knowledge i have of social media i always describe it as, as twitter and things like that tends to be it's it's the pub that you would never go in if you look at the uh if you look at the comments mm -hmm. if that was a pub it'd be the roughest place you wouldn't go in it because you know it's just full of abuse and it's fallings out and people looking for fights. Well, it seems to be people looking for verbal fights, aren't they? And it makes their Saturday night or Sunday or weekend. It's a story to tell the mates if they've, they've got a nibble out of a, and I'm not just talking knots players, but they've got a nibble out of a player, a celebrity, and it's unpoliced, isn't it? So, you know, it lets anybody get away with saying anything in the hope that they get a rise. Well, you've got two options. You either don't rise to it, you don't read it, or you come off it as far as I'm concerned. But like I said, that's a very simplistic view. I know, you know, and, and people will say, why should they come off social media? They, well, they shouldn't maybe. And again, I don't know the, the technicalities of can you block people? Can you just let your friends and family see what you're putting out? I have no idea, but um, it's a shame. But it is, unfortunately, you see a lot of this in the modern world, isn't it? it it's the way it is. And you have to adapt. There's a real world and an ideal world. And, and I've said it to my kids and I've said, you know, say a lot going through. Unfortunately, we have to live in the real world. We can all have dreams of an ideal world, but you have to live in the real world. So if social media is a place full of these trolls, as they're called, are they? That if they affect you, if they're, they're bothering you, and if they're getting personal, if they've got personal access to you, I didn't realise they could send you, you know, vile messages directly, then absolutely I'd be off it. Absolutely. But... Um, I would question whether they are genuine Knots fans or just genuine idiots, but either way, it's it's nothing to be uh, applauded, and and it's a shame that any player has to put up with that. I say, take it in the ground, take it from people who paid their money, um, but not not personal and and not direct. And if it's not something you'd go up to the player and say face to face on the street, then 
don't 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 be a big man and say it on Twitter or say it on whatever social media platform it is. But like I say the real world, it ain't going to change. It, it isn't going to stop. So you have to find a way of coping with it, dealing with it as players. And again, another good sign is that that if it's one player getting criticism, it was Jim O'Brien getting, you know, the messages that that there are other teammates having his back, you know, fighting his corner, showing the togetherness that you know it's not acceptable. And you hope that that okay, that, I think as players you do, you would have a little bit of a say and say, look, we ain't putting up with that. And you you, st- you try and find a way of stamping it out before it becomes the norm, the commonplace thing that. After every, you know, not perfect performance, somebody's getting some personal abuse for it because because all of a sudden it becomes a bit of a trend. That's what what happens. I think they've done the right thing probably in putting something out there and saying, look, get behind us, you know, try try and back us up. We'll take criticism. That's fine. You know, we'll use that as motivation. But it is absolutely right. Players players do not go, the whistle don't go and then it's all hunky dory. It affects your weekend, your week. It affects everything. It affects everything, and and um, I know it affects fans. Absolutely, it affects fans just as much. Um, but yeah, it's not it's not a case that players are blasé, and and you know certainly not the, the bunch of players that Notts have had in the last two or three years. That I think they've been a as good a dressing room, as good a attitude of players, a, a group of players in terms of giving what they've got as as you're possibly going to get. That's certainly no. I would never criticise them. I don't think at any time over the last few years for not giving everything they've got. They might not play well on some occasions, but that's life as as well with national league footballers and and sort of we are non league. Like, yeah, we are non league footballers at this moment in time. So um, unfortunately, yeah, it's 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 a terrible part of modern day life that that you know these youngsters, these young lads have to seemingly accept it and and I'm glad that they don't just accept it I'm glad that they do want to make a stand in the right way without you know without overstepping lines and causing problems or whatever but you know they shouldn't have to tolerate personal direct abuse on social media but you know I don't know how you stop it yeah it's it's an interesting debate and I was thinking before tonight's show you know, do because some many people will not have seen Connell's response. Uh, but equally, when we say it's a really, really small minority, I think it's more than you think, and it certainly gets viewed by more than you think. Um, let's get a few comments. So, eight o'clock, Connell for PM. Well said. I'm not sure what the P, I'm not sure what the PM is in Wales. Um, I don't know what what the first minister. First minister. Oh, for first minister, AD. Um Gary Morfis. Well said, Connell. Uh, Chris B, I find the mute button on Twitter very useful. Um, Dylan Room, I don't blame when players want to leave at all, when a small portion of our fans are like that. Uh, Then they moan that those players are playing two to three leagues higher than us. Chris, (coughs) right or wrongly, the players shouldn't respond to any direct messages. It never ends well. In my experience, the best way to deal with idiots is ignore them. Um, the counter argument to that, Chris, Ian, and I get a few as well. You know, on this show, everyone is spot on, right? But there will be some numpties out on social media that will try and have a dig at me, or they'll have a dig at the other people. I'm not worried about me, as they will tell you. You know, rhinoceros skin. You need to have it in football. Um, but you know, one of the other podcasts, Notts County Talk, uh, Tom and George do an excellent job, uh, and Tom put out a tweet half time um and he's kind of said i don't think we've been too bad why are people booing he got pelters right now everyone's entitled to an opinion i thought the first half was very poor but the language and the way people were totally disrespectful ignorant and rude to, uh, in response to tom i think it's quite disgraceful you know your point about the pub's a great one step you know the pub you don't want to go into you know i use the analogy that if you go into a pub would you say the same things to a person in the same way as you do on social media? 99.99% of them wouldn't. So why do you think it's respectful or acceptable to express an opinion in that way on social media? And the other thing, uh, which is an answer to Chris's point, 
Of course you turn the other cheek. You should turn the other cheek. I suspect maybe Jim O'Brien thinks, I wish I'd not you know, had a little bite and had a little nibble. Um, nobody likes criticism. I don't care who you are. And when one or two people have had a dig at me or, or, or other people I've seen on social media, the moment you front them still, the moment, oh, no, no, oh, no, no, well, no, I didn't mean it like that. Oh, no, 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 you're misreading it. And I mean, Martin O'Neill, my mentor at Leicester, uh, he had first three months, couldn't win a game, got promoted, end of the season through the playoffs. Now, the first two months of his reign, I'm talking abuse. I am talking massive abuse from like 10,000 people. Uh, he got loads of letters. Uh, he used to show them to me. And you think, bloody hell, you know. Uh, and to be fair, they did at least put their address and a telephone number on, or sometimes just an address. And he kept them all. So at the end of the season, he got promoted. He sits in his office one night, seven o'clock at night, checks the addresses, director inquiries, have you got a phone number for this name and this address? Thank you. Da, 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 da. Hello, is that Jonathan? Yeah, Jonathan, it's Martin O'Neill here. <coughs> So what you uh, yeah Martin O'Neill, you wrote me a letter three months ago. You said I wasn't fit to be manager of Leicester City. Just wonder what your thoughts are now. Well, no, I didn't mean it like no. I was no, nah. and they all, every single one of them, completely melted. Every single one, you know. One of them even said, "Oh, I didn't write it. It was my brother." <laughs> <laughs> and the, and the, uh, the point I'm making here is that people are fundamentally cowards and, and they're more cowardly than ever before on, on social media. I do worry a little bit. I do worry a little bit because I, I think this is going to get worse, you know, Stan. Younger people have a different mindset to us with social media. They live on their phones. I'm not going to start quoting Ryan Giggs's court case. But part of that is that Ryan Giggs and his then partner were basically, by the admission of both of their solicitors, were totally addicted to their mobile phones. Couldn't live without them. You know, I would question why fans want to be tweeting while they're trying to watch a game, because all you're doing is then not watching the game. But I think it's a different culture still. And if you look at the 15, 16, 17-year-old footballers coming through the youth ranks, it's just an extension of their personality now. And either you need a thicker skin, you need better media training. But I think it is an absolute ticking time bomb. Because I, I just see it getting worse and worse and worse. And even people I know who are normally sane people have like an alter ego on social media. They just suddenly become disrespectful. and. I don't know. I I worry a little bit for it. Um, I worry a little bit. Uh, Chris Gosling says, we're in a world where having an opinion is offensive, irrespective of what that opinion is. The art of reasoned, healthy debate is dying on its backside. Uh, Dana Huskisson, keyboard warriors never, never have anything to say in person. Uh, Dylan Room, if people don't like it, stop watching. It's as simple as that, because there will always be more people watching than not. Um, uh, Miles Scott, um, at Gateshead, on either side of me, two people who never stopped moaning for 90 minutes. The guy on my right in his 70s, um, but had his knife out, I think that's metaphorically clearly, for two players, no matter what they did. I'll move next time. Uh, North Ants by isn't it just society now? Blame someone. Social media gives a platform for the worst of this. Um, I mean, the other thing that just annoyed me a little bit, and clearly it's annoyed some of the social media, it's a number of people that have kind of said, oh, Notts County have got a disgraceful fan base. We've got the worst fan base in the world. We're doing this, that and the other. The reality is it's the same at every club still. Do you know, I've seen, I have seen Boris fans Moaning. First time back in the Premier League for 20 odd years. What have you got to moan about? Oh, the ticket the ticket office computer's not working very well today. You know, we haven't got a sponsor on the shirt, right? Now, clearly you might hey, if I'm Chief Exec at Forest, I might be having a word, right, as to why we haven't. But is there something to moan about when you've just got a point at Everton, you've beaten West Ham? I just think social media encourages people to be 
very, very critical. Yep. Well, I say, you, you won't hear many positive words about it from me, but then I say I don't engage with it particularly. I, I don't. Uh, it's not. But it's not my generation, you know, so I, I've not grown up with it. I understand that the youngsters do. And I would like to think that that going forward, you know, just like just like youngsters being educated more about equalities and inclusion, read things that, that we weren't, you know, I'd like to think there comes a point where they do educate and, and stand up for themselves and say, enough's enough, we're not taking this abuse and and they find a way with social media to, to maintain a social media platform, but one that is vetted one that is policed one that is regulated you know at some point but you know again real world ideal world will it happen who knows but uh i, I don't football fans moaning paul has happened since the beginning of time i, I, I imagine i imagine they were like that in the 1800s 1900s when it started so um you know but that's just part of football we see emotion in football that that's the one thing and, and not to give anybody a caveat and a get out clause but Emotion plays a massive part in football. It's probably, it's a probably more emotive than anything else. You you don't get so emotive over the TV or anything else, but it but football brings out emotions that, in the cold light of day, you look back and analyse behaviours and go, well, that's that's not how you behave normally. That's not what you do. I've done it myself on a football pitch. Yeah. See Tuchel and uh, what's his handshake? Tuchel and Conte the other week. You know, like. <laughs> You go, but that's that. So that's players, managers, coaches. It gets to all of them. It gets to fans as well. Again, doesn't make personal abuse right, but it's it's an emotional thing. What you would like to believe is, and I and I do take the point what you say, and you're absolutely right. Is it does tarnish the name of Notts County because social media is open to everybody, and and you always have other fans checking in with your fans' social media. So if there's a an internal spat, if you like, between Notts fans or supposed Notts fans and Notts players and players are having to get involved and, and what have you, you can bet your bottom dollar. Other clubs, fans will yeah. see it, spread it and go, look at Notts, they're toxic. Look at them, they're in disarray. They're all over the place. And it, so it tarnishes Notts' name. You know, it, so the, nobody wins out of it. Nobody wins except the the sad little person who maybe who gets a, a bite on, on Twitter that makes their week, their year, because they've got nothing better in their lives. Um, it sparked quite a bit of debate, which I thought it might. Andrew Blatherwick. <laughs> Paul, most of my extended family are Forest fans. They've been miserable moaners for 50 plus years. Um, we, the, 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 anon, anonymity clearly emboldens people. We've had this discussion before. I think it's somewhere like China where to be registered on social media, you have to put your national insurance number in or something. Um, uh, Andrew Blatherwick, the problem is that the keyboard warriors can hide behind a pseudonym. If they had their names broadcast, then they would have to have a different attitude. I certainly think it would mitigate some of the more uh, extreme views. And I believe the extreme views that were sent directly to Jim O'Brien was by, surprise, surprise, someone who uh, uh, remains anonymous um, to do a Dylan Room. That's why the idea was floated about um, uh, about your ID when you sign up for social media, which I think they should go through with. Uh, no doubt the Human Rights Brigade would have a problem with that one. But anyway, let's not let's not let's not go down that route. Um, to, to, to ben Hawks with the Green Pool. The over the top negative fans are annoying, but the fans that go the other way and say everything is great and say that not fans are the worst, so they can stand on their pedestal are. There is, a, I think, there's a bit of a fractious relationship with fans at the minute uh, that manifests itself across social media. Uh, Gary Morphus, my GP advice for high blood pressure was to support another club. <laughs> Must have been a Forest fan. Uh, Miles Scott, for once something from China that I would support. Um, <laughs> right. Um, Neil Warnock, I forgot about that. Yeah, obviously, I've not had too many messages, so you know there's a little bit of spin coming here. So Neil came back uh, on Saturday, uh, gave some great tales, um, and a lot of people have spoken about Neil's doing a tour of uh, cities of his former clubs where he speaks in theatres. Yeah, so obviously Sheffield, Plymouth, etc., etc. Um, there is no Nottingham date being announced. 
And the reason for this uh, was because when Neil's agent contacted the Theatre Royal, the Royal Concert Hall, uh, he got put through to uh, a ticket office manager who we can only assume is a rampant Nottingham Forest fan. Because the guy's gone, oh, hey, we're far too big. We're far too big to have an, an evening with Neil Warner night. You won't get more than 50 Knots fans coming. And the guy was fairly adamant. And so Neil's agent has to put the phone down and say to Neil, we can't get a venue. So uh, in talking with Les Brad uh, at the weekend, um, Knotts County uh, are planning to come to the rescue. And we will have an audience with Neil Warnock towards the end of the season. The club are working out a date with Neil's people. And so the event that, according to the Theatre Royal ticket manager, would only sell 50 tickets is now going to be held, uh, fingers crossed, we've got to be sorted at Meadow Lane. Therefore, Neil Warnock is returning to Meadow Lane later this season. There we go. Um, let's wrap up, Stell. Um, Halifax. So Halifax lost their manager to a football league club. So did Notts County. Um, Halifax have lost several of their best players to clubs in higher divisions. Uh, well, so was Notts County. Halifax are bottom. We're halfway. OK, so we're coping a bit better than Halifax. Um, is it one of them where the fact Halifax are bottom is immaterial still? At this point, yeah. At this point, it's obviously not the start they wanted. No, you know, one point, no goals scored. Um, but again, they're, you're absolutely, you're not underplaying it. They are virtually a whole new team, you know, new manager. And yeah, largely all the better players were, were cherry picked, weren't they? And went elsewhere. So uh, they're almost starting from scratch again. And, and, you know, it's it's not gone the way they would want it to, obviously, at the start. And let's hope that carries on for another game, at least. According <laughs> uh, to Chris Goslin, they've not scored either, just to make it even no, they're not. Worse. No, no, they're not scored. They've got one point. They've had a nil-nil, a couple of one-nils and a two-nil. So, uh, you know, yeah, they, they've not had the start any team wants. But four games in, I mean, nobody get, well, nobody should get excited about a league after four games, but... Um, you would say possibly a good time to play them, maybe, but uh, it, it counts for nothing. What what you see in this division, as we in most divisions, it's the same. But I, I, the lower down you go, I think more so the unpredictability of it. If anybody had a sat there after four games, well, I think Barnet will be top and Wheelstone will be yeah. second. You, you get out of town, you're talking rubbish. But that's just where it is, you know. So. So that shows I do look at the league table. I don't pay any attention to it, but I do look at it. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything at this, this stage. So, um, you know, let's not put too much emphasis on it. It'll be a tough game, like any others, because at, at, at National League level, what's gone before is no real indicator of what you're likely to face in the next game. Teams are so up and down, so hit and miss, even the better teams, that... You don't know what you're preparing for. You have to prepare properly. You have to care about what you do. Knots have got to go there and aim to to up their levels. You know, take that finishing 30 minutes on, on Saturday and start like that and carry on like that. That's the aim and they've got to do that more often than not this season. And if they can do that, then they've got enough to win the game Saturday. Um, but just because Halifax, you know, bottom of the table, haven't scored a goal yet, don't mean that this Saturday or doesn't mean that this Saturday is going to be a walk in the park because it absolutely isn't. You know, it's a small sample size for games to have a look at. They are a new team trying to get together. They'll have all week to work and you can bet they'll be focused on righting the wrongs of their start to the season. So it'll be a tough game, just like every week is. You have to go out there, you have to earn it, you have to show your ability, show your quality, show that urgency. And and if they do that, then then they get, can get the result. Uh, Chris Gosling, Halifax bottom yet to score. Gulp, Andrew Blatherwick, Hugh Halifax put in three pastors. Dylan Room, 3-0 to them at half-time. 
then the, then the comeback. Um, Max Seth, three points for Halifax. You know it will happen. Chris Gosling, would anyone take a point? Question mark. I don't forget it's Solihull on the bank holiday Monday as well. Um, to, to, to Chris Gosling, definitely to win. Two games in three days will be a test. Scott, definitely not ready to play both. Going to have to use the squad efficiently. Uh, Z-O, yes, welcome Z-O. Uh, Chris, if we'd won one of our other away games, then yes, point would be okay. But a win equals three draws. Um, Stel, don't think you're getting away with it. You thought we're, we're, we're finishing the show now. So, <laughs> would you be starting Kedwin Scott up top with McCordy Langstaff on Saturday? If if I thought he was fully fit, yes. Yeah, I would. Um, I think we've got to see them, you know, when, when he's ready. When he's ready, not, you know, and again, you do have a look at two games in, what, 72 hours? Yeah. So, you know, you maybe have to be a little bit careful but like that. But he's got all week this week. He was fit enough to come on. If he's fit enough, if you think he's fit enough to get, get 90 minutes out of him, whether he plays 90 or not, but, it, but you've got to be able to do 90 because if you get injuries, he might have to play 90 if you're starting. So, yeah, I probably would. Um, but also, I would have an eye towards Monday's game at Solihull as well. Yeah. Um, and, and, yeah, you would have to shuffle the pack a little bit. I, I've got to say, I'm a little bit surprised that not and maybe they did try to get the game on a Friday. I know a couple of the games have been moved to Friday, so there's a bit more respite between games. Yeah. Um, but it's yeah, it's, it's certainly when the fixes came out, it was a tough start to the season, wasn't it? With with teams looking at where they finished last season. Yeah. So Halifax away on Saturday, Solihull at home on Monday, tough weekend, but but could be a good weekend. Obviously, given two good performances. Let's certainly hope so, Stel. Thank you so much for your time, as always. Thank you to everyone. And at least, um, well, what we've shown tonight, proper, respectful debate, as is always the case with us. So thank you to everyone. Um, we will see you next week sometime. I'm not quite sure when I'm doing the next show. Uh, I'll probably give Stel the weekend off. We probably won't come back till after the Solihull game. Have a little bit of a mini break uh, in between the Saturday and the Monday. Thank you for everyone for your time, your questions and your observations tonight. As always, um, we'll get going. Um, for those of you watching us live, there's, there's, there's an half-decent game on in the Premier League, isn't there, tonight, Stel? The Even relegation like clash, isn't it? There's a relegation clash in the Premier League if you're looking <laughs> at league tables this early. Ah, hang on, I'll get a load of bloody flack now from Manchester United <laughs> social media people. Don't be disrespectful. Right, okay. Very good. Take care, everyone. Thanks, Del. Thanks, Cheers. everyone. Take care. Bye bye.